Okay, so welcome everybody. I, I am happy to be here. I've been in India for three months now as a Fulbright Chair and I've had the opportunity to travel around the country and uh, speak to a lot of different universities and work with folks and trying to better understand what's happening with India higher education. Um, I started in Australia about seven, eight months ago actually and have been working to learn on what's happening with Australian higher education. And so it's been a year of a lot of learning for me. Um, my background and interests have been in understanding how do we do a better job of getting students excited about the things that excite us. And my training is actually very traditional research science. Um, my, my PhD is in microbiology, soil microbiology, and ecosystem ecology uh, from UC Berkeley. And I was about as gung-ho focused on my research as anybody got. And I started at University of Wisconsin-Madison as an assistant professor, assuming that all of my students were going to be equally fascinated by dirt as I was. And of course, that's not true. And after a year or two, I realized, OK, something's going on here and um, recognized that I was teaching to the people who were just like me rather than teaching to everyone who's in the classroom. And what we know is that only 2% of our students are actually going to go on and become research scientists, um, faculty members. So only 2% of our students are interested in the topic for its own sake. And I realized a second thing early on in my career, which was I went into environmental science, climate change work, because I wanted to make a difference. And I was very engaged in that as a young scientist. And then I came to realize that no matter how much data I collected, it wasn't being used. And we weren't communicating the science effectively to the policymakers. So that, coupled with my students not being as excited about soil as I wanted them to be, led me further and further in the direction of, of teaching and education. And what do we do to better engage our students? And so over time, I moved in that direction. Eventually, I reached a point where I thought, OK, I don't have the influence I want to have on higher education as a single faculty member, as a professor. So I want to have a chance to help not just students in my class, but all students in all classes. And the way to do that for me was to become an administrator. So at University of Wisconsin, I became the director of the Institute for Biology Education and got very invested in um, life science education to start with. I worked as, and I'm still one of the first 40 um, National Vision and Change Leadership Fellows that the Partnership for Undergraduate Life Science Education created. Um, that was National Science Foundation of the US, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and National Institutes of Health got together and said, we need to do something to improve life science education in the US, but of course, I think globally, it's a similar problem. Unlike any of the other allied sciences, biology has changed more in the last few decades than, than anything. And, and just the amount of information, the new discoveries, the research, the way that we do it is vastly different than the way that we teach it. And so that's what's happening in the US. They're calling attention to this misalignment between the way we do the research and the way we teach the science. And, and so there's movements all over the place across the US to, to fix biology education. And that's something that I got very involved in before I moved to Australia. Um, and I'm still very invested in it, but now I have the opportunity to expand and go beyond just the life sciences to actually working across the STEM disciplines, um, which is one of the reasons that I moved to Australia to have that opportunity. So what I want to talk about today is some of those ideas that I've been playing with for a long time. And this idea of teaching as if learning mattered. If we were focused on learning rather than focused on teaching, what would that mean? What do we do about that? Uh, and so that's what I'm going to talk about. Today, is a, it's a presentation mode, lecture mode, right, in that sense. But I want to make sure that it's, it's I, I'm very casual and informal. And so if you have questions, if it's a burning question, feel free to stop me. Um, I'm going to show a couple of videos, pose some things for you to think about. And at the end, um, hopefully, intention is to leave time to address questions that you have. This afternoon, I'm getting to do an actual workshop, an interactive workshop um, about uh, functions of a teacher and, and, and basics of, of becoming a STEM teacher. So OK, getting started now. Teaching as if learning mattered. Um, like I just mentioned, there's a lot of concern about the future of higher education globally uh, and, and science education in particular. There's increasingly a need for educated workforce um, as we already know, there's a ton of changes in information and technology, uh, changing demographics, and shifting priorities. So if you're in the US, it's aging populations. 
and older people don't want to pay for school, they want to pay for protection, police forces and hospitals. And so they're not, pay, they're not putting money into education. Um, here, it's just the large number of students. This is where all the young people are. Um, and so there's, there's just shifting priorities that we have and things that are changing. And then, of course, the increasing complexity of the problems that we're facing. Um, so if you look at the headlines from the last several years in the US, you get all of these crises of confidence threatening colleges. Uh, there's a lot of questions about whether or not college is even worth it. It's very expensive. There's a recommendation to drop out of school entirely and just become an entrepreneur. And you don't even need a college degree. You can just do free online courses. And so there's a lot of concern about the disruption of online courses. And so I'm more familiar with what's going on in the US, but I've been watching the headlines here. And there's concern about the quality of education here as well. And so above all, there's this very big concern that students aren't getting value. They go to do a three-year or four-year or a five-year degree, and they sit through the classes and get a piece of paper at the end. But the worry is that they're not really learning very much in between. And there was a, um, a really major study that was done a few years ago um, called Academically Adrift, where they, they looked at students' critical thinking and problem-solving skills at the beginning of the university time. And then they looked at them again in their last year, and they realized that the students hadn't improved at all. And so over the course of four years, they had no gains in their education. So there was a real concern about that. Um, and there's been a real concern about that. So the question is, what's happening? Why, why is this happening? Yeah. Right, that's a good question, whether or not that kind of study had been done earlier. Um, of course, just like any study that has controversial findings, it was had tons of people arguing with their results, and there's been a lot of attempts to redo it. Uh, they were, there was nothing like this done prior to that. The, the size, the scope of it was new. Um, the way that they measured it was not available in the past. Or they, we didn't have those instruments. We weren't asking those questions. Uh, so no, they, they're basing it on just what they saw as a snapshot right now. So it's. Right. I, I agree. I agree. There's a marginalization of the learning return in all, in all likelihood. Uh, that's part of the reason why it was so controversial. And it's been something that's been brought up since then over and over again with people arguing that no, college is worth something. Yeah, there's a reason to go to college. Yes, they're learning something. They were one of the first people, though, to raise the issue of what are they learning? What are they doing when they spend four years sitting in a classroom? Are they learning the things we hope that they're learning? So there's value in the study for the attention that it brought. Um, but I'm, but I, I'm with the people that are skeptical about, OK, this doesn't mean this is not the law. It's just this one study. But it's a, it's a good question. Um, so the, big, the, the thing is that we, it makes us ask, what is going on? What's happening? And um, so really, the way, when I've been thinking a lot about it, and, and um, other people have been thinking and speaking about it too, the problem is that our current education system was designed for a world that doesn't exist anymore. Right? We, we, we expanded here and other countries and in the US higher education when we were entering the industrial era. So we were moving into an era of um, standardization, factories. So our model that underlies our system of higher education is a model that came out of the industrial age. And what we know, of course, about factories in the industrial age is that we, when we're, what happens in a factory, what we create in a factory is a standardized product that has to have the same tolerances, it has to be able to do the same thing over and over and over again. And so if this is our idea about education and what a student should be able to do, then we may be having a problem. It's a misalignment. So our model came out of an age that we don't, we don't have that age anymore. Now we live in an accelerating world. This is a video I want to show you that when I look at it, I think about what does this mean for education and for our students? And it's a video that's just a, it's about four or five minutes long. And, um, a lot of data, it's outdated by now. It was made a few years ago, several years ago. Uh, I'm waiting to see somebody make a, a, a new version that's better, but I still like it, and I think it makes an interesting point. So I want to have you watch that and think about what does this mean for the way that we educate our students? So it's just music in the background.
I like the video because it, in one place, encapsulates kind of what the problem is that we're facing. And again, in the biological sciences, I think it's even more striking. I was going to say, when it talks about um, all of the information, the new information that's created each year, I'm thinking half of that is coming <laughs> out of biology. Uh, so we live in an accelerating world. And what, what stands out for me from that particular video, right, we're currently preparing students for jobs that don't yet exist using technologies that haven't been invented in order to solve problems we don't even know are problems yet. And four exabytes of unique information will be generated this year, more than the previous 5,000 years. So when I look at that and think about my job as a teacher, it's a little overwhelming, you know, to think about trying to teach a textbook and cover the content. And how on earth is that even possible? And on top of that, not only is this world accelerating and the pace of information is increasing, and we're asking students to drink out of a fire hose of information, but we're living in this very, very quickly, rapidly changing world, right? So it's urbanizing. There are problems in environment. There are problems all over the place, socioeconomic, political, all of that. <clears throat> and these are complex problems. These are not linear, simple, technical fix problems. It's not quite as, as, as clear cut as pull a pollutant out of the water. These are things that span political boundaries, um, and they're very, and they're so they're complex, they're complicated to figure out how to fix, and complex problems need adaptive and creative solutions. We don't need just linear technical fixes, we need um, adaptive uh, solutions and fixes. So the way that we currently educate our students, the question is where are these solutions going to come from? So if we, if we continue to educate in s disciplinary silos, and put the students in boxes and have a degree that's biology or maths or physics or whatever it is, then how are we going to find the problems that the, the solutions to the problems that cross all these boundaries? Uh, and that's the big question I have. So if we're treating our students as if they came out of a factory, how are we going to find the, um, the, the solution to the problems we need? So the way that I think of this is we don't need cogs. We don't need parts in a machine that would be produced in this industrial model. We need catalysts. Right? We, need, we need the ability to catalyze new thinking, innovators, entrepreneurial thinkers, boundary spanners, and we need all the minds working on this. Um, and that's a big point of uh, a lot of the work that I've done in, in education and curriculum design, is how do we find ways to span those boundaries. So I've got one more short video right now that Sir Ken Robinson does a really nice job of talking about this as well. Has anyone heard of Sir Ken Robinson? Okay, most of you have then. Have you seen the changing educational paradigms, RSA, Animate? Okay, a lot of you have. Some of you haven't. I mean, it's, I've clipped just a really short bit from it um, to reinforce this idea. I, I believe we have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, so ringing bells, separate facilities. Uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. You know what I mean? Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines, you know, or at different times of the day or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula, and it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study done recently of divergent thinking published a couple of years ago, divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the, the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's a, an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think what Edward de Bono would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways, uh, to see multiple answers, not one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of cod example would be people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? One well, of those routine questions. Most people might come up with 10 or 15. People who are good at this might come up with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paperclip be 200 foot tall and be made out of foam rubber? 
You know, like, does it have to be a paperclip as we know it, Jim? You know. Um, now, they tested this, and they gave them to 1,500 people. This is in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So, my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested, of the 1,500, scored at genius level for divergent thinking? Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So, what do you think? What percentage at genius level? 80. 80, okay. 98 percent. Now, the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later, age of 8 to 10. What do you think? 50. They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend here, can't you? <laughs> now, this tells an interesting story. Because you could have imagined it going the other way, couldn't you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is, we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up. A lot. But one of the most important things that happened to them, I'm convinced, is that by now, they've become educated. They, you know, they've spent 10 years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. And don't copy, because that's cheating. I mean, outside schools, that's called collaboration. You know, but <laughs> inside schools. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way. It's just because it happens that way. Um, it's because it's in the gene pool of education. We have to think differently about human capacity. We have to get over this old conception of, of academic, non-academic, abstract, theoretical, vocational, uh, and see it for what it is, um, a myth, uh, secondly, we have to recognize that most great learning happens in groups, that collaboration is the stuff of growth. If we atomize people and separate them and judge them separately, we form a kind of disjunction between them and their natural learning environment. And thirdly, it's crucially about the culture of our institutions, the habits of the institution and the habitats that they occupy. So. That's what Sir Ken Robinson is saying then. And the question that to think about, right, is what does it mean for education? So we've got a factory model. We've got this isolation of students from each other, a non-social model of learning. Uh, and the real question then that from, stems from that is, what if the learning needs to solve these problems, the need for creativity, what if the learning needs are changing, but our teaching style is not? And that's a big part of what I'm working on with faculty in Australia, worked on with faculty in the US. It's the big problem that we're facing with most of the universities is that we were taught to lecture. And lecturing is a traditional mode of teaching, so we think, right? And lecture has been around forever. So this is a great picture. It's a wall fresco, a mural that came, um, was made in 1350. And it pretty much shows that since 1350, we've had people lecturing, right? And it's pretty, this is a typical classroom. People talking in the back, somebody checking Facebook, um, somebody sleeping, these two are flirting, the goody two shoes in the front that are answering the questions and paying good, you know, all the attention. So somehow or other, classes have not changed much since 1350. And so we lecture. And we know there are consequences to lecture. Well, there are consequences to lecture, right? We lecture, especially now, this is what tends to happen. And probably even more severely, this is a plot that somebody made of percentage recall um, over time. I don't know how it's possible to have 120% recall. I'm thinking that means you start making things up. I, I, I'm not sure. So whoever made this, uh, I don't know how it is that they thought 120 was an appropriate number to put. But starting at 100, within five days, you've lost 80% of what, was, what you heard. So 80% of what was lectured at us is lost. Um, there's actually, I don't, have, I don't have slides on this right now, but the, but the concept of spaced repetition and a way of learning and actually reinforcing and having things move from short-term memory into long-term memory. Um, we know that spaced repetition is a way for people to remember things. We don't use it in our classrooms. So most classes teach something once say it once, expect the students to memorize it, and spit it out on an exam, and we don't actually use the principles of spaced repetition, unless we're teaching language. 
But it's kind of crazy, actually. I've been thinking about this. Why is that? If we know that that's how learning happens, why are we not using spaced repetition in all of our classrooms? It's a whole other thing. And I, I'm playing with that right now to figure out what can I do it, with my professors that I'm working with, my staff, and have them think about how would you build in spaced repetition? The biggest complaint, the biggest concern about moving beyond lecture is the idea that we don't have enough time to cover the content. It's the biggest issue. But if we're going to lose 80% of the content anyway, maybe we're better off covering less and having them actually remember it. So that's, that's a thing I'm, I'm for, for me, I'm playing with. How do I help? I have 350 faculty members I get to work with. How do I help them figure out how to have more than 80% um, or more than 20% be retained? And so we also know this triangle, right, that 5% of what we hear overall by lecture is what we retain um, on average. And then the more active reading, audiovisual demonstrations, discussion, practice by doing or teaching others, we can get up to 90% retention. So what that means is ultimately I'm the one getting all the benefit if I'm the one lecturing. And I theoretically already know my subject. So I don't need all the benefit. The students need the benefit. Um, so this is, this is the consequences to lecture. So we know it doesn't work. And the question is, why do we continue to do it? And I think there's a couple of simple answers, right? One, it's what we know. So Eric Mazur, if you've heard of him, gives a great talk about how he was, he's a physicist from Harvard, he teaches at Harvard, um, how he, he, when he learned to teach, he was going to lecture because it's what he saw everybody do. It is, when I was going through school, it was the only thing I ever saw people do. Lecture was the only way that you saw people teaching. And so it's what we've seen for a really long time. So we don't really have many models ourselves of other things. And the other thing that I've been thinking about is that it used to be necessary. So going back to that video about did you know, when 30 years ago when there wasn't internet, and you either went to the reference library or you listened to your professor, right? Because it was the source of information. And so 30 years ago, it was necessary for me to lecture because we have to transmit content somehow. You're not going to have learning without content at all. Um, and, and so it was necessary. And some people, some of the teachers that I work with have been teaching for the last 30 years. And so they've, they've not quite realized that maybe we have internet now. So we have these very long standing ideas about what is a professor, um, these stereotypical thoughts. If you ask students what is a professor, um, at, at least in the US and Australia, you come up with Harrison Ford <laughs> with glasses and a bow tie and a tweed jacket, and usually leather patches, and oftentimes a pipe or something, right? But you get this, this classic idea of what is a professor. You might have seen, if you look at the images or you ask children what is a scientist, they come up with something equally egregiously stereotypical, which is you know, a white lab coat and a, and a beaker, um, or a, a, you know, a flask or something like that. It just, it's not at all. The, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm, I, yes, I do lab work, but I, I do a lot of field work. And as an ecologist, I'm in hiking boots and with a rucksack and out in the woods. And I'm not in a white lab coat at all. Um, and that's still science, but kids don't think that. Anyway, so we have these thoughts about what a professor is. Um, you know, you can look on the line. And when you look up modern, when you look up professor, you get image after image after image just like this. Um, it's glasses, leather patches. Not a bow tie, but a tie. I'm not sure why the eyebrows are disconnected from the head. I don't think that's biologically possible. But clipboard and um, male. And usually, if you just look up professor, and if you're in the US, it's white male. Um, and this guy, Professor Bookwright, he is the gatekeeper of all knowledge. So this is from a game called Energy Smackdown. And I was looking up games and science. The interesting thing is, if you look up modern professor, on Google, you actually start to see significant numbers of women, um, people who are not white, people who are, so you get a much, much wider variety. People dress differently. So a modern professor is allowed to be different. But professor, this tends to be what it, what it looks like, right? So Professor Bookwright is a gatekeeper of all knowledge. So professors are the experts. And we're very invested in being an expert, right? We spend a lot of time doing our PhD and developing our subject area knowledge to great depths. And so we are the experts. And, and that's true. But we live in this accelerating age, right? So we live in this exabytes and exabytes of data, mind-boggling numbers. So 
our role is changing, right? And, and I've had this happen in classes. Excuse me, Mrs. Warren, Google begs to differ, right? The students, if you allow them to have smart devices, and I would argue that we should allow them to have smart devices and laptops and tablets in the classroom and make use of them appropriately, have the students look things up, have a challenge, have a contest to see who can look it up faster. They're gonna be distracted by things anyway. So have them be distracted by something you want them to be distracted by. That's kind of my philosophy. Don't fight something I can't win, um, but, but use it. So anyway, they can look up anything within a split second. So, you know, Mrs. Warren, Google begs to differ. So then, you know, lecturing, the professor was the expert. There he is, Norman Rockwell, bow tie, glasses, white male suit. There he is, the professor. And now, of course, we've got Google. And so if you Google Google, and I did this a few years ago, actually, you get 3.8 um, billion hits in 0 0.09 seconds of what Google is. And if I look at my own field of soil carbon and carbon sequestration, I get more than I could ever, ever hope to know in multiple lifetimes and find out things that I didn't even know were happening uh, about soil carbon. And so I'm not the gatekeeper of knowledge, even in my own field. Um, so I can't compete with Google. None of us can compete with Google. So now what? If I'm a teacher, what does that mean for me? If I'm not necessary as an expert, I've got to rethink my role. So I actually have this book, but I haven't quite read it yet. I'm reading with the book shut. <laughs> but teaching with your mouth shut, right? So we've got to rethink our role. What is it that we're doing? And so there's a lot of examples, um, especially in the STEM disciplines, of things like this where people are trying to do scale-up classrooms where you can actually have students working together, working on their laptops. Of course, these things are very expensive, and most places can't have them. But the idea is the same, though, is that we're disrupting what, it, what a classroom looks like. And so in this case, it's a little bit like, where's Waldo? Where's the teacher? I'm pretty sure this is the teacher right here, kind of standing at the control room, the podium, um, but in the center, not up front and the students are working in groups, and any one of these laptops can transmit to any one of these screens. And so you can work in a group, come up with a solution, share it with the room, go back into working with the group. It's really effective, but it's a very different role for the teacher. And so a lot of you have probably heard of the sage on the stage versus the guide on the side. I don't like those two phrases. They're a little bit too kitschy for me. Um, to trite. However, it is the, tr the truth, though, that we've got to shift from being the content provider and the expert to recognizing that other things can provide content better than I can. There are videos out there. There are books out there. There are structured ways for students to get the information. Um, and my job is to create a learning environment, not just to, to provide content. So I can guide the students to content. I can point out what's interesting content. I can help them make sense of that content. I can help them structure it in a way that they can remember it. Um, because if any of us have tried to learn something entirely new just using Google, you realize it's actually quite complicated. It's not that easy. We want an expert helping us. Because as a non-expert, I don't know how to make a framework. So I tried to teach myself microeconomics. Don't ask me why. But just by looking at Google, it was a lost cause. So I ended up defaulting to taking a Coursera, you know, a free online course, because I wanted to learn something about microeconomics. So there's a role for an expert to help structure and organize the information. Uh, I, I taught an online class last year where I didn't lecture a single time. All I did was create lists of questions, because I thought, well, if I'm lecturing, what I'm doing anyway is actually answering a series of questions that I've embedded uh, underneath the, the information I'm giving. So I thought, well, why should I answer the questions for them when I could just give them the questions? I've done just as much work by creating the questions and creating the frame and challenging them to go find the answers. And it was actually very, very successful. And they never once complained that I wasn't lecturing because I was taking their input, their attempts at answering the questions, giving them feedback immediately. And, um, and I think it was a more powerful learning experience in a lot of ways. And I could do that because it was online and they had access to the whole web. And so I was helping them learn how to use the web in order to learn. But anyway, our job has to be different. Um, and so I just gave one example, but a lot of people then ask, okay, how? How am I supposed to shift when all I've ever seen is somebody lecture? What am I supposed to do to do something different, to be different? So um, the first thing is we've got to let go of all hope of being the primary content provider. And like I just said, recognize that the web is out there, that videos are out there, that students do know how to read, even if they're used to reading on little screens and reading digitally, right? So give up all hope. Let go of ideas about what a classroom is supposed to look like. 
I mean, this is, this is crazy, right? But this is still how we teach. I think psychology is still taught this way almost entirely in the US, where the largest classes anyone has, takes are psychology intro classes. There are a thousand students will be sitting in one classroom, um, which, is, which can be done. You can do it. And I would love to teach a class of 1,000 students someday. I would absolutely love it, just to push the limits of what we think we can do. But the way that we traditionally do it, it's not, it's not that good. So let go of ideas about what it should look like. Let go of ideas about what learning is supposed to look like, uh, especially now, right? These students are different. This is a different generation entirely, especially now. Generation Z is who we have in schools, which is the, which is the generation born in 2000. These are the students that they say are truly the digital natives. Even the millennials are not quite the digital natives. These are the kids that are, right now, the research is alarmist about don't let them touch a smartphone until they're eight because of brain development issues that they're starting to see now. That when little kids, babies practically, are playing with tablets and smartphones, that there's a very real impact on brain development. And we don't know what that impact is going to be. Now, I don't tend to prefer the alarmist approach. Just because it's different doesn't mean it's worse. But we don't really know. And we, but we do know that the kids that were born after 2000 truly grew up in this digital age, and they think differently, and their brain is, is formed differently, and they see the world differently. And I have to account for that if I want them to learn. And so to me, that's a really critical thing. So I have to let go of, just because I think learning looks like reading textbooks and studying in a traditional way, doesn't mean that that's how they're going to be even capable of learning, because their brain is different. So that's something. So we have to deliberately design learning environments that engage students. So here's my challenge question. Does anyone know what this is a picture of? You might only know it if you have, if you have children or small children. It's a Montessori classroom. So I was told, I thought this was um, a US thing, but when I first got here, somebody said, no, actually, Montessori, she was here. Uh, and so she brought Montessori classroom ideas to India as well. But the idea of the prepared environment and that kids will gravitate or people will gravitate toward what they're interested in. And when they're interested in something, they're likely to learn um, a lot more, a lot faster, and a lot more deeply. And so if we prepare the environment and let them choose where they want to learn. And, and on any given day, they're going to learn a lot more. So I keep wondering, how can we do this with our colleges or our universities to a greater extent? If we really want to move past an industrial narrative, how do we allow some of the choice we allow it in grad school, right? Because you would go to grad school, you pick the thing you want to work on. And then I think a lot of us might have had the experience of suddenly the science gets a lot more engaging and interesting. And we want to stay up really late working on it. We're excited about the discoveries. We want to do the data analysis. I hated chemistry as an undergrad, but then I ended up doing an almost entirely organic chemistry oriented uh, PhD and loved it all of a sudden. And it wasn't because chemistry had changed. It was because I suddenly had an interest in it. I got to choose it rather than somebody forcing me to do it. So we want to deliberately design these environments to engage students. So right, my favorite question, well, how do we do that? What does that mean? So ultimately, it comes down to we have to pay attention to more than the content because the content is out there. So we let them find it. Let them help them find it. But it's not just about the content anymore. So we've got to pay attention to the method that we use. right? the delivery method. So there's tons of workshops, books, papers, everything about active learning and all of that, which is why we're, you know, it's because we've got to go beyond content, pay attention to the method that we use, and got to pay attention to the space and the logistics. So when we learn to teach, we're usually focused on how do I organize my information? How do I make sure that I'm clearly explaining it? How do I give a good lecture? And we might start thinking a little bit about, OK, what's this active learning stuff, and how do I start to use that? But we don't always think about the fact that, well, what about the fact that if I want them to do something active, you guys are stuck in the middle, and you're never going to get out to try to do something active. So I can't have you getting up and walking around, because in a room like this, it won't work. If, I, if we're in a really sta uh, a steep auditorium style classroom, I can't have you talk to each other easily, because you're going to be staring at the knees of the person behind you if you try to turn to the person behind you. So there's things like that that become barriers to effective learning. The things like the classroom is too cold, it's too hot, it's too dark, it's too light, um, it's too smelly. In, in Wisconsin, in the winter, they, they insist on assigning classrooms that are exactly the same size as the number of people you have in the class. And in the winter in Wisconsin, it is minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit routinely. People are wearing 18 layers of clothing because they have to walk between classes, and there are no covered bridges like there are in, in, in like 
smart places like Minneapolis. Um, and so the students come in and they're all bundled up and then they sit down in a classroom and they can't put their clothes anywhere, their coats, and there's mud and snow and sand and salt all over the floor and they don't want to put their coat down, so they sit in it and then they sweat. And you've got a really smelly classroom. <laughs> and, and it sounds silly, right, but these are things that are distracting. So if I want the students to be focused on what I want them to learn and they're worried about the fact that their coat is getting filthy and soaked and disgusting and their neighbor stinks, they're not paying attention to learning or they don't come to class at all. And, and so it's a problem. And we don't usually pen, pay enough attention to these ideas about space and logistics. If I have a class of 500 students and I have to pass out paper, it will take me a substantial, measurable amount of time to pass out paper to 500 students. So I have to build that into the class design. So when I say deliberately design an environment, I've got to think about that. Um, uh, I had a, a class that actually did have 200 students in it once. There was one, it was like this, but imagine 200 people. 200 people in the, in the classroom before, 200 people coming in the classroom, and one door. And they have 10 minutes to get in and out, and the professor inevitably was late letting his students go. And so my class is trying to get in, 200 people moving this way, 200 people moving that way, and it's kind of like you know, the streets, the city streets out here. <laughs> it's traffic, and, it's, and they can't, and so there's no way that I will ever start my class on time when that's the situation. And not only that, but think about the mindset of the students that are now coming in and sitting down in that classroom. They're frazzled. They're worried about being late. They're worried about missing something. They're not gonna get their favorite seat. And you know that bothers us, right? We all have a favorite seat. And we don't wanna be forced to sit someplace that makes us uncomfortable. And they always sit in the same place, which is how I can learn names. People say, how do you learn names for a lot of students? It was easy, they always sit in the same place. So you assign the name to the chair. <laughs> and, like, and you know that person's gonna sit there, I don't have to worry about it. And if they move, it messes me up completely. But anyway, right, so, so the logistics of the classroom is something we don't always spend a lot of time thinking about, and it really does matter. And because we, if it's about learning and not about teaching, I need to get the barriers to learning out of the way. And these distractions and these fears and these stresses and all of this are, are a barrier. And that comes down to the last thing we have to pay attention to, which is the people. And not just diversity, not just learning styles, not just all of that, but the fact that they are people. They are humans. They are unique. They do have stress. They do have fear. They do have whatever they have, relationships, aging parents, um, Sometimes children, sometimes jobs, they have other things that they're worried about. And again, that becomes a barrier to learning. I have to look at, okay, if I'm teaching a class at the end of the day, and they've just had five or six classes or however many they've had leading up to my class, what's going to be their mental state? Probably not very good, right? And, and, and it's not my fault, but it's what I've got. And so again, if I'm teaching for learning, not teaching for teaching, I've got to account for what I've got sitting in my classroom. And if they're frazzled and they're tired and they're having a bad day and it's the end of the day or the very first, the very first part of the day. So they're 18 coming into university. They're still teenagers. They still need more sleep than we expect people need to need. <clears throat> and they have to take a class at eight in the morning. Right, so is their brain gonna be operating at peak optimum? No. So it's the same thing. We've got to take into account the fact that they're people. And a lot of times when we hear about this, we hear about, again, like I said, we hear about um, <clears throat> diversity, uh, cultural differences, learning style differences. There's some research I've been seeing lately. I want to look at more into it, but it's basically saying, okay, learning style is just a total myth and it's just silly. And I tend to agree with that. Um, really what it comes down to is everybody's a little bit different. And like Sir Ken Robinson said, some of us learn better in the morning, some of us learn better in the evening. So how can we work to individualize our learning experiences? And that's a whole other thing where I, I like the use of online, but it's not for, for today's talk. But if we're gonna deliberately design these learning environments, we've gotta go beyond just thinking about content and, and account for these four facets of a learning classroom. And then the, um, ultimately what we have to do is make learning active, engaging, and fun, right? And, and, and fun and science for some reason have become uncoupled in the vast majority of our science classrooms. And so I love this picture of this poor little boy. Everyone knows learning must be serious and difficult and you must remain seated at all times, no fun allowed. Now, I, I don't know why, in the, in the arts, they have fun. And in humanities and literature, they have fun and they have discussions. And for some reason, 
we don't we we, see, we seem to think that science is not supposed to be fun it's very serious stuff it's very important we're solving important problems it's very serious but it shouldn't necessarily be fun is the natural way for us to learn fun is it's just engaging we want to engage them so how do we do that the most important thing we need to do is be enthusiastic ourselves and I have um, research that I did over the course of my teaching career. I've probably taught about 12,000 students so far in my teaching career. And every time I've taught undergraduates, graduates, small classes, large classes, up to about 300 students, um, not larger than that yet. And every single class, I start the, the semester by asking the students, what are the top two or three things that make a class a success for you? So the students are telling me, what is success? And I've been really, really impressed by the range of things they come up with, but they come down to the same set of categories, um, one of which is the, the professor needs to be organized and all of that. Um, they want to get a good grade, all of that. They, they know they need to work hard. They know they need to study. They know that very well. But we all, all of us, because we're all humans, we know, we know that there's a disconnect between what we know is good for us and what we actually do. And so the students are no different. They know they should come to class. They know they should study. But the thing that struck me over and over and over again, almost more than anything else, was the importance of having an enthusiastic professor. It didn't matter what the topic was. As long as the professor liked it, the students were going to be interested. So we have a tremendous amount of influence on the students just by the way that we approach our topic. And when we share with them what it is that we like about it, they're more likely to get interested themselves. And there's a whole very, really neat model of interest development about how you spark students' interest and how you grow it, and then how it over time becomes internalized and becomes their own interest. Um, and obviously, they have to have a latent interest in to begin with. You're not going to create interest in somebody that has no interest whatsoever. But it's a way to, to build it. Um, and that's, um, yeah, so interest development, getting them, getting them excited, getting them interested means us being interested and excited ourselves as well. And so that's the first thing. But what we also really need to do is embrace the fact that this is a wiki world right now, right? And they are different students. They're not us. Um, and learning is very social. So when they want to figure out how to do something, the first thing they do is go online and ask a community of practice. They don't read a manual. They don't do any of that. Go online, ask a community of practice, how do I solve this problem? And then you'll get all of those answers. I mean, I do that too, right? I have a question, how do I fix this? I go online, I type in the question, I get all the possible answers. Um, so it's very social, it's mobile, right? They're taking their learning with them everywhere. And we can leverage this, we can take advantage of this, and we don't necessarily do as good a job of this as we could. Um, there's no reason why homework couldn't be um, go out and take pictures of things and then post them and have a discussion about what you found. Uh, and we're, we're working on that with an online, open online class where it would be like, what's wrong with this picture around the world? And so students that are taking the class around the world can post a picture of an environmental issue and then people can see it and discuss it. So we can leverage this more than we do. And also it's gamified, right? So games and learning is a huge uh, topic of, of interest. And I'm not going to go into too much about the gamification. I'm going to give you an example of a game that we actually made. Games and gamification are, are different things. Um, games. Uh, help create, help us achieve a learning outcome. Games teach content um, and thinking skills. Gamification influences motivation and behavior. So they're not the same thing. People sometimes get them confused. Um, however, games and learning are, are, are a really interesting and emerging field. And, uh, and so I, I, find, I find it fascinating. I love games. I love playing games. Um, but so embracing this world means finding ways to, to engage the students actively. Right. Don't just sit them in a classroom. So the first example I have of this is using creativity and authentic audience. It's engaging and much more fun when you know you're doing something real for real people. And this came out of um, all the work on motivation for humans. And uh, there's a book by Daniel Pink that he wrote recently called Drive, uh, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. And that humans are motivated by three main things. Uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So autonomy, simply self-direction. So when we're given a choice, you can do this assignment or that assignment. You can ch choose the, to go deeper in something that interests you. Whenever we have a degree of autonomy, it's much more engaging and interesting for us, and we're more likely to want to follow it up. And the ultimate thing is engagement. When we're engaged, you can't stop us from learning. And this is, this is just how people are. We like to learn. Um, so we like autonomy. That's a, a motivator. Um, Mastery. We like getting better at things. 
So when we're given an opportunity to get better at something, we want to get better. We like it. We like solving puzzles. We like answering questions. Um, and anybody does. It's not just us who happen to be scientists and scholars. Uh, it, uh, to me, I think the most important thing that I can help my students with is to come up with really intriguing questions. Because when I put a really intriguing question out there, somebody is desperate to answer it. And they want to answer it. So um, mastery, <coughs> we like getting better, and that purpose. We like doing things that have a reason for it being done. We don't like busy work. None of us do. We like to think that what we're doing and our efforts are related to something larger. So <coughs> when I built this into my classroom, this was an upper level uh, soil microbiology class. And I challenged the students to, for their final project, come up with a way to teach a topic from class to a non-academic audience and deliver that product, deliver their, their project to that audience. So they knew it was a real person that they were going to be working for. <clears throat> so they had choice about what they did. They got to develop their skills in doing it, and then they delivered it to a real audience. So it had a, a bigger meaning than just a project that I would grade and no one would ever see again. And so <clears throat> excuse me, the results were they worked on all kinds of different projects. In this case, this is a woman who wrote a song about sporulation and bacillus in soil. And when I learned sporulation, it's actually quite complicated. If you want, it's, it's, it's uh, the, the pathways and what initiates it and how it happens is quite complicated. But she wrote a song about it, uh, or she wrote the words. She co-opted another song, the, the lyric, the music, and wrote the lyrics for it and um, posted it on YouTube, where oh, about a month ago or so it had 17,000 views, which is not bad for a song about bacteria. Um, and the, yeah, so the endospore song, and she had us singing it. That was that picture that, that I showed. And people have been looking at it. So this one, my microbiology professor showed this in class yesterday, and I've been singing it ever since. Um, this should be taught at class instead of a 20-page long, I don't know what this blank was. Somebody blanked it out. It must have been a bad word, but I can't think what bad word it would have been. Anyway, <clears throat> this should be taught at class instead of a 20-page long that means the same thing. I bet I'm going to start singing this at the exam. So. The thing is, with creativity and evoking other senses, this is how we help people engage, get interested, and remember things. Um, I can't remember history to save my life. I cannot remember dates and times. I don't know why. My brain just doesn't. I can remember every biologically trivial fact that anybody ever presented to me, the Latin names for things I should not remember, and I cannot remember the date that something happened in an important date in history. But if you put it in a song, I'll remember it forever. So I can sing songs. Um, like the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, right? And this is how we, so in the US, of course, you have to learn about Paul Revere in American history. But um, this is how we teach children in, uh, in oral traditions as well, right? So singing songs is why we have songs and nursery rhymes and various things. This is how we learn. So no, I mean, it's not that everybody needs to go make songs in their class, but it's impactful. Uh, the only reason I can remember the laws of thermodynamics is because when I took chemistry as an undergraduate and I was a freshman, um, 18 years old, actually at that time I was probably 17, and the, the professor uh, played a song about thermodynamics sung by a couple of British comedians. And he stood on top of the lectern, and it was bigger than this, it was like a demonstration table. He stood on top of the demonstration table and he did a strip tease <laughs> while the song was going on about thermodynamics. <clears throat> and I can still remember the song, <laughs> and I can still remember the second law of thermodynamics at least, and it is forever branded in my brain, this image of this man starting to unbutton his shirt and all going, oh my god, what is he doing? <laughs> of course, nowadays you could never do that. You'd be thrown in jail immediately. But, but there's lots of things that we, that we could do then that we can't do now. Anyway, it, but it, it, it's powerful when we engage other senses. It's the same thing when we, when we smell something that reminds us of our childhood. All of a sudden, all of these other memories come back. So it's, it's ways to make, to make learning more engaging. Um, and it works. It works really well. So here's an, just a, a quote um, from the student that took the class. It was taught in a different way than all the other courses I've taken at the UW, University of Wisconsin. It made me want to learn, not just get a good grade on an exam, but because I wanted to. The final project was my favorite part because it allowed for creativity. And by presenting it to groups, I got to see how other people think. And I have many new ideas now. So of course, this is what I want for my students. And it goes back to what we saw in the video from Ken Robinson as well. It's creativity, letting them work together, letting them learn from and with each other. So I, I, um, I, I did that every year. The results were always the same. The students loved it. They were engaged. Some students, and I don't have the quote here, wished that I had forced them to be creative. Because it was more conservative, quieter students, that younger, and they had just come up through school, and they were worried about being too creative. Because it unsettles them because it's really hard to grade somebody's creativity. And so part of making this work is reassuring them 
that we're grading them on effort and we're grading them on basic factual accuracy. But we're not grading their creativity. It's about just expressing yourself. And that, that makes it better. Um, but there are things to consider when doing stuff like this. So there's that. The other thing I wanted to show as an example was this um, not using an actual game for teaching something. So, so I spent um, about two years with a team at University of Wisconsin de developing a game to teach nitrogen cycle. Right? And this is a particular teaching challenge. Any of us that have, had, have tried to teach it, those of us that have tried to learn it, it's always presented as a two-dimensional picture in a book and lots of paths and lots of things going on, right? It's, it's, it's a significant teaching challenge because it's complex, all kinds of things going on. There's always a cow in the picture. Um, oh, I, well, I did find one once in a soil ecology book that had a rabbit and not a cow. But it's, so it's usually a cow in the picture. Um, it's got really ugly chemistry. So a lot of our undergraduates don't like chemistry anyway. And then you give them this with the redox chemistry associated with nitrogen and forget it. It's the, it, it took me three separate classes before I could really understand the nitrogen cycle myself as a grad student. And this is what a lot of my research ended up being. Uh, so it's hard to teach. And students hate it. They hate the nitrogen cycle. They hate learning it. Teachers hate it. Uh, I've had high school teachers trying to teach nitrogen cycle. They don't understand it. They hate it. They don't want to teach it. But the thing is, we all probably realize it's absolutely critical. Probably more than any other subtopic within any discipline, nitrogen cycle is taught more broadly, more widely, and has more importance. So if there's anything we need to get right, we've got to get the nitrogen cycle right. And we don't tend to. It's taught across all these. So I thought, well, it kind of looks like snakes and ladders. So why not make it a game? You know, It looks like if, if anything needs to be a game, this needs to be a game. Um, and so we developed a game over time where we did concept testing and rapid prototyping and, and playing with what might work. We had a team of um, an instructional designer, a games and learning specialist. Uh, I was a subject matter expert and a gamer. Uh, and then I had a grad student helping me uh, who was also very interested in games. And so we developed the game. We tested it over time, different versions of it. This was an early prototype where it was more linear. But of course, it's not linear, so I didn't want to have leave the students. We did this like a drag race, get to the end fastest. Um, but it's not a linear thing, so I didn't want it to, to, to be that. So we changed the board. We made it circular. Um, the way it's played is a physical cards and a board. And, um, and you move the nitrogen through the cycle by drawing cards, some of which are bacteria or agents that transform the nitrogen. Other cards are events that impact the nitrogen, like leaching it into the groundwater or volatilizing it into the atmosphere. So every single card has something real on it. It's a real thing that happens in the environment that impacts nitrogen. Um, and then we have cards which are resource cards, carbon, um, fixed carbon, or carbon dioxide. And those are the things you need in order to power the agents which do the transforming. So the students are learning that it requires, fixed, it requires an energy source and then all of these things affect the nitrogen cycle. So this was an, another version before the final. And then the final one, um, this was four years ago. We were playing it in Pune at a workshop with 50 college biology professors there. It's been played in multiple places around the world, in Brazil, in Sweden, all over the US. It's actually freely available. It's Creative Commons licensed. And there's a print and play version, which is what we were using here. Uh, and they, they picked it up like that. I've had high school teachers pick it up. The high school teacher learns about the nitrogen cycle and uses it to teach high school students uh, college level. I've played it in community groups. We've got people who are retired, and they're playing it. And so we, we designed it so the game is fun to play, and it teaches them something. And so it really does work. So you can get stuff like this, and you do a pre-test and a post-test. We've collected a lot of data. I had a student do her master's thesis on what impact does this game have on a student interest in science and student learning uh, in science. And she looked at uh, an ecology class, an agronomy class, and a microbiology class. Oh, and an intrabio class. So she looked across a spectrum of classes. Um, just play testing. We did a pretest. We said, OK, draw the nitrogen cycle. Before you play this game, draw it. And you get all kinds of stuff, usually just a big question mark. I have no idea. This person at least attempted, well, it's got this stuff in it. I, like, I know the species, the chemical, but I don't. And then after playing the game, this is what they came up with. So this is the game is put away, it's packed up, and then I say draw the nitrogen cycle again. So obviously this is very short-term memory, but if it's not in your short-term memory, it's not going to go into your long-term memory. So this is immediate. Now we have, a, I think this is a coyote, because I very deliberately did not include any cows anywhere. <laughs> uh, because the thing is, the reason the cow is always a cow and it's always agriculture. So I have nothing against cows, I love cows. But 
the nitrogen cycle happens in more places than just agricultural fields. And so that's why I very deliberately, this is a coyote. And there's one card that's basically a picture, a graphic of a coyote peeing on a tree. <laughs> and the card is um, mineral fertilization. And so when you play that card, you add ammonium to your, you can add your pieces and move it through the cycle. So nitrogen comes in from outside. It cycles within. It does everything that nitrogen does. You can, there's a card that's called a lightning strike, which fixes nitrogen out of the N2 pool directly into nitrate. Um, we had to tweak the game because students were, they weren't cheating. They're just good gamers. They're smart gamers. So you can have a combination of cards. If you have the right cards, you could do a lightning strike and fix the nitrogen. Because the game, you have to go from N2 all the way through to N2. And so you've got to get, you start with five, you have to get at least three back into the N2 pool by the end in order to win the game. So these students would take a lightning strike, and they would lightning strike from N2 to nitrate. Then they would have a, a denitrifier ready to go. <laughs> and certain cards will swap the environment from aerobic to anaerobic. And so you'll, they'll flip the environment. So they'll have it all set, ready to go. Lightning strike, one turn, and they win the game. Lightning strike, change the environment, activate your denitrifier, boom, I won the game. So we had to change the game so that it couldn't be won quite so easily. But this is, this is the kind of engagement the students have with it, and it actually is fun to play. And it's based loosely on Magic the Gathering and that kind of card strategy game, um, which I used to think is really fun. So the results from this, um, asking the students about their experience playing the game and about the content. Um, so the first question, what surprised you while playing the game? And they said things about content. So stochastic events can really mix things up. <laughs> I didn't realize how important aerobic and anaerobic conditions were for advancing the cycle. And nitrogen didn't have to go in cyclical order. So you've got carbs that will decompose the nitrogen from fixed carbon to, to ammonium. You've got other carbs which will take it up back up into a tree. You've got other carbs which will leach it into the groundwater. You've got a card called deep taproot, which will pull it back up out of the groundwater and put it into a tree. You've got cards that will release it as trace gases into the atmosphere. You've got another card called acid rain, which will rain it back down into the cycle. So the students are seeing that it's going everywhere. And it's not just going in a cycle. I love this one, too, though. I mean, how many college students are talking about how mixed up stochastic events make things? I mean, it's, so they're, they're using the vocabulary. They're thinking about the processes. They're recognizing that it's not just a simple, simple thing. And then the experience of playing the game was also impactful for them. I actually learned the processes. Putting it in a game setting made it interesting and easier to understand. And then what surprised me was how competitive, interesting the game was, fun with science. So they were having fun with playing the nitrogen cycle and playing the game. So this is, I, I just, I like their handwriting, even if it's hard to read. The nitrogen cycle is cool. Game added complexity to my understanding of the nitrogen cycle. I want them to say it's cool. It is cool. It's totally cool. Um, learning the nitrogen cycle was more fun. And then this was comments they got to an open-ended question. I want a copy. So I look at that as complete success, right? You've got students asking to have a copy of a game about science. And that, to me, is success. So the games work, right? Impact on the knowledge of the topic, their vocabulary, their lower, lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy, vocabulary, um, recall, the steps, the organisms. They can list these things, which are necessary for knowing the nitrogen cycle. It also had an impact on their cognitive processes, their critical thinking or systems or strategic thinking. We designed the game that way, and we could, we could evaluate and see that they were improving in their ability to um, allocate scarce resources, consider the trade-offs associated with one choice over another, look at the impact and see that it doesn't just go in a cycle, that it goes all over the place. Uh, and then other things we saw is that it increased their engagement, it changed their attitude towards science, toward the topic, it gave them ownership. So just like they start talking about um, uh, you know, how, how do I win the game? Some of them got very invested in how do I win the game. Other ones got invested in how do I make the processes more realistic? Like, um, how do I, how do I, how could I add cards to this game that, that I think should be there? So I had a group of students say, or a student say, well, you know, the thing is, and it was set in a grassland, which is a prairie system typical of Wisconsin. The thing is, so you need this fixed carbon, and carbon is a limited resource, which it is, and in the game it is. And they said, but shouldn't it be the case that, suppose a, a buffalo wanders into your system and dies, and, and then, then shouldn't you have a big pile of fixed carbon right there? And, and so shouldn't you get a bunch of fixed carbon? And so they were designing the cards, so they're designing the game with us. 
another group of students, another student thought, okay, wait a minute, but you know, you have this dust blowing in from, from China, which is bringing nitrogen in. So shouldn't you have the dust coming in and have a card which is actually bringing it? So then we went back and we designed cards and added them to the game because these were completely realistic. But again, you're having students thinking very differently about the nitrogen cycle through the context of this game. And not everything's going to work as a game, it's just this one was really powerful. Um, so the thing is, games work, fun works. So this is a couple of other projects students were working on for their creative thing. Somebody who brought this to an elementary school classroom, it's a, a wall hanging with stuffed microbes that you can move around in the soil. This guy started a prototype of a game about phosphorus, um, so phosphorus cycling. So in the end, um, wrapping this all up, thinking about what does this mean? Uh, and, and these games and creativity and what do, we, what do we need to do? What does it take from us? And we need to trust them, right? So come back to the fact that they aren't us. They are people. They are engageable. They are interested. They are, in fact, motivated to learn. Um, they want to learn. I, I don't think I've ever had a student come into my classroom and, and say, at the beginning of the semester, I hope I don't learn anything this semester, right? They want to learn. Everybody does. We, we prefer it. So they're not unmotivated students. So a bunch of quotes from them. They know what they need to do. I need to practice my working with other skills. I tend to work very independently. I also need to work on being wrong because I won't always be right. I love that student. Um, the ability to critically think and write, diligence and practice, the ability to write well and present ideas to others in a clear and concise manner. Um, I think communication skills and reasoning skills would be the most important skills I need. Uh, they're useful no matter what field I enter. And then I think the desire to learn is a key part in success in the future. Also, the determination to never give up. There's always new information, so it's good to always be learning. So these are not unmotivated students. And the question, since I've, I've, I've run out of time, I had one more example, which I'm not going to show you because I'd rather um, not keep going. But the question to leave us with is, how might we teach differently if we really believed our students wanted to learn? And how might we teach differently if we believe that teaching and learning were fun? So to me, that's ultimately what it comes down to when I think about the concept of teaching as if learning mattered. It's not about my ability to organize information. It's not about my intelligence or my proving myself, which of course is another reason why we tend to teach the way we do is because we're so accustomed to the peer review process. And we're so accustomed to being, if not attacked, at least criticized constantly. We're always having to prove that, we're, that, that our answers are right. We're always having to prove ourselves. But the students already believe that we're right. And they already think we're smart because we're the professor. So it's not about me proving that I'm smart. It's about me sharing what I'm excited about and creating an environment for them to get excited about it too. And so that, that brings me to the last picture, which is just this simply believing in them. And, and when I've done, and the, the example I was going to show, and I, I'm gonna, I hate having to flash through slides quickly, but I'm going to have to do that. And I'm happy to share the slides with anyone that wants them. But ultimately, it's about trusting them and believing that they want to learn and they want to do big things because they do. It's a hallmark of their generation. They really want to make a difference. And when we offer them the opportunity to do that, they can. And I keep seeing examples on the web of 12-year-olds, 17-year-olds, younger people creating incredible solutions to problems like the de detection of pancreatic cancer or um, picking up the plastic in the ocean or photo, photo, photo catalysts to uh, clean drinking water. There's just amazing things that young people can do. And so we need to be telling them and encouraging them that they can do it, not sit be quiet, listen to me because I'm going to tell you how it is. So we um, created a challenge project for them to help us solve the problems and, and save the world. And they want to help save the world. And so it was very successful. So my, my example that I'm not going to belabor was simply that we asked them to help us save the world, sustain human well-being beyond 2050, given that we're going to have 11 billion people. So I'm challenging them because who knows what they're going to come up with because they're still young and they're still flexible, just like Ken Robinson said. So we challenged them. We said, help us do it. We created a curriculum. We, we framed it around five different systems. We had them present their work to Florida's industry leaders. So they had a real audience they had to present for. They were doing real work for real people, which is authentic. And the results were that it was transformative for them. It, um, it was very, very impactful. So it got them thinking. It got them out of thinking about themselves and thinking about the world that they live in. And when I asked them on the first day, why are you taking this class? Why are you doing this? They said, because I'm going to be alive in 2050, and you're, you're maybe not. <laughs> right? And, and so they know. It's their world. So that was kind of what it came down to. So the bottom line, it was transformative. 
it illustrated cross-silo effort and vision because the five systems that we worked on were not just one biology. It was across everything. Um, and it was authentic learning, and it, and it worked, and it was really simple. And ultimately, ultimately, that's what it all comes down to. It's simple. It's not that hard. We've got to be enthusiastic. We've got to engage them as partners. I'm not just the expert. They know what it means to be 18 and 17 right now. I don't. Um, they know what they're interested in. I don't. So I'm engaging with them. I'm trusting them to want to learn, and I'm believing in them. So um, this is one minute from Sir Ken Robinson. Um, um, and then, and I have a big interest in education, and I think we all do. Uh, we have a huge vested interest in it, partly because it's education that's meant to take us into this future that we can't grasp. If you think of it, children starting school this year will be retiring in 2065. Nobody has a clue, despite all the expertise that's been on parade for the past four days, what the world will look like in five years' time. And yet we're meant to be educating them for it. So the unpredictability, I think, is extraordinary. And the third part of this is that we've all agreed, nonetheless, on the really um, extraordinary capacities that children have, their capacities for innovation. I mean, Serena last night was a marvel, wasn't she? Just seeing what she could do. And She's exceptional, but I think she's not, um, so to speak, exceptional in the whole of, of childhood. What you have there is a person of extraordinary dedication who found a talent. And my contention is all kids have tremendous talents, and we squander them pretty ruthlessly. Um, so I want to talk about education, and I want to talk about creativity. My contention is that creativity now is as important in education as literacy, and we should treat it with the same status. Thank you. So, to me at least, that's what it ultimately comes down to. It's providing that space, that freedom, that prepared environment, designing for learning, not just for teaching. And so we need every single mind. We need to encourage them to be working on these problems. And in the end, it's, it's going to be, they, they recognize. It's daunting, it's disheartening, but we're going to overcome. And a student saying, at first I thought, what can I do? But it's a team effort. We're not going to see change overnight. Sustainability is possible through incremental changes, and the potential for a better tomorrow is real. It's the reason that I do what I do with the teachers as well. It's incremental, but we're going to get there. So anyway, I appreciate your attention, and um, thank you very much. And if you want to stay and ask questions, I would love to answer them. If you need to go somewhere, I won't be offended. I recognize I've taken more time than I should have, so thank you. Some, some sort of assessment that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. some, some way and some metric yep. of progress. Yep. So in this framework of like early thinking and creative thinking, mm -hmm. how does that fit in? How, does, how do you get assessment? Right. Well, it depends on what I want, what my goal is, right? If my goal is ability of the students to regurgitate content, then I'm going to assess them on their ability to regurgitate content, right? I'm going to give them quizzes. So in my upper level class, there is a certain amount of vocabulary that's necessary for them to learn and to be, f to be readily familiar with. And this is true in most of the biological sciences. So I had quizzes and tests for them to, to be able to, to encourage them, to, to hold them accountable for learning that vocabulary. So, that, so that for that learning goal, that's how it was assessed. For the creativity one, my learning goal and my outcome that I wanted was engagement and um, practice with skills that they might need in the work world they're going to enter. And so the assessment was, did they use creativity? I don't have to like it. I don't have to agree with it. I didn't, I didn't think all the projects were equally interesting. But did they use it? Um, and asking them to reflect on their experience. Were they able to be reflective? Did they develop skills that they think they're going to use? So the assessment there doesn't have to be about were they right or were they wrong. But it was really, we, we spent a lot of time developing rubrics and thinking about how do you evaluate um, a student's effort. And you know, things like, did they follow the directions? Check. Uh, did they put effort into it? What does that look like? OK, how do I evaluate that? How do I rate that? Uh, and then was it at least a little bit creative by somebody's definition of creative? Uh, and, and that's that. So it's just like with anything creative. We can't say that wasn't creative enough. But, we're just, but, that, but my goal wasn't benchmark against the world's best artists. So that's kind of how I look at it, is goal by goal. 
how do I best assess what it is that I want them to be able to do. So I have a it's on okay so um, all of these techniques are extremely effective right and they but they require dialogue they require interaction not only from your side but from the side of the students right mm -hmm. it requires act in, in order to have active learning so my question I think is how do you how do you get students to become active learners when they have never been allowed to ask questions? Right. Um, because I actually find, if I may speak boldly, that this is a real problem, uh, particularly in this country, where a lot of the educational system is still very much regurgitative. Right. Students are not allowed to ask questions. They're not even actually sometimes taught that they can have a question right. um, or even that they're smart enough to have questions. Right. So, and particularly when you have people who have gone through a system like this for up 10 years or more, right? Mm -hmm. Getting them to suddenly open up. So for example, when I work in schools now, um, if I work with seven or eight year olds anywhere in India and in, in, a, in a, a school where they don't ask, but they, they will pretty quickly learn how to be active learners, mm -hmm. including in high school students will as well. But the higher level you get, especially when you get to the level that the people are, are here at NCBS where they've actually gone through mm -hmm university if they've never asked a question and now they're like 22 years old that is really it's hard right. it's not something you can just jump in and do and i naively have done this several times already and and it it, do, it simply doesn't work so my question to you is how do you right. get them to believe in themselves right, right. absolutely which you absolutely first yeah before you teach any of this wonderful it, yeah it really is the ultimate challenge and two two answers to that the first is the recognition, they're, they're related to one another. The first is the recognition that it's a relationship that I'm creating with a class. And I'm going to be doomed to failure if I come in and ask them to do something really weird, really out of the box, that they're not familiar with, because they're going to resist, they're going to push back, because they're people. It goes back to the managing the people part of it. We don't like to look stupid, and we don't like to look foolish, and we don't like to be wrong. And it's a risk. If I say something and I engage, and it's, it sounds dumb, my colleagues might laugh at me and the professor might think poorly of me. And this is bad. And so this is a risk. So we have to recognize the risk that a student is taking by participating. That doesn't mean we give up on it, but it comes to the second bit, which is, okay, it's a relationship. And we often ask too much too quickly from the students. And I do a workshop on activating learning. Um, and it's little tiny incremental baby steps. Things like, don't ask them to talk to each other at first or talk to me at first. Just the, the, the best way to improve lecture is to stop, ask, and then listen. That's it. Ask them to write something on their own. So there are ways to increase the safety of participation and step them into it while I'm building the relationship with them. It's absolutely critical that I establish that I will not make them wrong. I will not make them look stupid. I will not challenge them in front of their peers that doesn't create a safe, positive climate. Now, other people, that's the way they teach. That's their style. And, and, and so I'm not arguing that it can't be done effectively. It's not my style. You know, my style is to create an engaging environment that's a safe space where they can share. And I'm not expecting them to ask questions at first, which is another part of what you're saying. Um, I have had the same experience. And I have the same thing. If somebody says to me, quick, ask a question, I go, I, I, I don't know what question I have. But if somebody says to me, what do you think of that? Or what stood out to you as interesting? I'm much more likely to have an opinion about that. And once we get them engaging, and then they see that it's OK and it's safe, then they're more likely to engage again. And then eventually, they will ask questions. Uh, I used to assign, as part of the end of each of my classes, I taught an intro environmental studies class that I didn't talk about here, that was 250 students. And I had them working in small groups simultaneously in the class, so 35 small groups working at the same time in a classroom. And one of the things that they had to do every single class was write down, what question do you have? And they had to think of a question. And I looked at how the sophistication of their questions changed from the beginning of the semester to the end. But I wasn't asking them to raise their hand and ask the question. I was saying, write it down. And so my, one of my learning goals, learning outcomes for them, was remember how to ask questions. Because they, we know it when we're little. We ask tons of questions. We forget how. Um, and I remember that from when I moved from undergrad to grad school. Undergrad was about giving answers. It wasn't about asking questions. And then suddenly I'm a PhD student in grad school, and they're saying, well, come up with questions. And I, 
I forgot how to come up with questions. Um, so yeah, it's a great point. Yes, sir. And then I'll come here. So you first and then here. So I have a question about something that you said right at the beginning. So a question about something that you said right at the beginning. And uh, I would like an answer from two perspectives, one as a teacher and one as an administrator who is trying to do uh, yeah. something. So, the, uh, so you said that how, how do we get students to do things as we do, right? As maybe scientists do. And I'm thinking that perhaps means that since we have been a product of this system which hasn't kept pace with things, we need to reinvent ourselves a lot. So how do we do that? And do you expect people to reinvent what they do apart from their teaching? And as an administrator, do you leave it to the diversity amongst different you know, scientists and teachers that you have in an institute? Or do you try to you know, sort of intervene right. with every individual and try to come up with, I mean, move them towards some sort of idea? Okay. Okay, I think I have both questions. The first one is how do I encourage the students to do what I do? And then as an administrator, how do I encourage the faculty that I'm working with? Yeah. Sorry, so the first question was, I, I get this part that the, the assumption was that how do we get students to do what we do? But I was thinking maybe that means that we need to reinvent a lot of the ways that we do things because maybe we have not kept pace with this accelerating world itself, right? Okay. So okay. how do we reinvent? The stuff that I we are doing. How do we help them when we aren't there yet? <laughs> is that what it is? Okay. Um, I think the very best thing that I can do for the students is model the things that are non-content related. If that, so when I'm being transparent about how I'm thinking, how I'm approaching solving a problem, um, when I'm actually willing to engage with them and learn with them, they will find out things and report back, and I can be genuinely interested and learn something new myself. So I had a student that was the first one that taught me about 3D printing and 3D organ printing. And she was interested in it, and she went out and found out about it and came back to me and shared with me what she had discovered. And so I could genuinely be excited about the learning process with her. And, um, and so she could see that I wasn't trying to have all the answers. Uh, and, and it was an example where I, hadn't, I didn't know. I hadn't kept up to date with that particular technology. There's no way that I could keep up to date with everything. And so, um, but I do know how to learn because presumably that's what I got from doing a PhD. Uh, and so that was one way that I worked with the students. Uh, and so creating a safe environment means that they're willing to come to me and work with me. They recognize that I'm not just the expert handing down information that may or may not be dated or outdated. Um, administratively, my philosophy or goal is to try to create the same kind of environment for my faculty that I want to create for my students the recognition that we don't all teach one way, and we don't all have one interest or ability. Um, some of us are really good with large classes. Some of us are terrible with large classes. Some of us are fantastic with smaller classes and detail and depth and challenging questions, and other people are really not. And yet we tend to assign teaching duties based on the, the, the need of the class in the sense of you know, you're assigned just because you happen to exist and I'm going to assume that you teach just the way everybody else teaches, that you're one-size-fits-all teacher, and we need somebody to teach intro bio with 500 students, go. It doesn't matter whether you're any good at that or not. You're going to be assigned to do that. And I, I think, for me, one of the biggest goals I have is to create um, a situation where we, do, where we can match teaching strengths and teaching talents to the situation that we have. And if we have a, for a person who is terrible with a large class, but really good with smaller classes. We've got to find a way to get them in front of a smaller class. If they're fantastic with a large class, get them out of the small upper level classes and get them in the intro classes and the lower level where the classes are bigger. So we don't do that. We don't treat ourselves the way that we say we want to treat our students in terms of active, engaged, leveraging what we do the, uh, best. So it's one of the things I, as one of the reasons why I moved into administration is to be in the position to start to change the system that way. Um, not just say you need to teach differently, but to say, okay, some people are fantastic lecturers, and I don't want them to not lecture. I just want them to lecture better. Some people are really comfortable facilitating a room and doing flipped classes and active things that are very cooperative. But it takes a certain person who can actually manage a classroom that way and be comfortable with that. And so I don't want to put somebody in that position. Right now I'm struggling with Curtin is attempting to say that all faculty shall flip their classes. And I have a real issue with that. 
Uh, not because I think flipped classrooms are bad, but because I think a bad flipped classroom is awful. And, and a tool is only as good as its user. And if you've got a faculty member that does not do well in, with a flipped classroom, don't force them to flip their classroom. That's wrong. Um, anyway, that's just an issue that I have with how do I work with the people above me who are seeing the trends. Trendy administration, right? Just like trendy grant funding. Trendy administration. Flipped classrooms are all the rage right now, so everyone must flip their classroom. Okay. That's a whole other issue. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, in contrast to the traditional methods of teaching by delivering lectures, there could be uh, newer facets of learning like problem-based, which could be giving them problems, a small short projects, which could make them think and think, and finally an inquiry-based learning, which could motivate them to ask questions. So my question to you is if you have to combine all these three and take a whole effective, uh, successful learning, how would you give priority to each of these in what order? How do we say the last part of your question again? So I'm if you were to combine problem-based, project-based, and inquiry-based learning, yeah. How would you combine these three, and in what order would you uh, give them in terms uh, of? How do I implement it and put it into the, um, there's, there's a lot of debate about where. And again, it probably comes down to what you're most comfortable with as a teacher. There's something to be said for challenging somebody um, right up front with something unfamiliar, having them struggle a little bit with it, and realize why they need to learn it, and then provide them some of the more structured, scaffolded content and, and steps because they're going to be in a position to take that in and say, oh, I see why I need it now, and then come back around again to that same kind of problem. Other people might be more comfortable or it might work better for them to say, OK, I'm going to outline the picture for you, and then we're going to have you do the problem, and then we're going to have feedback, and I'm going to ask you to relate back to the pieces now that you've seen how it all gets put together. So I think both ways could be successful. Again, it's, it's, it's not, there's no one way to do anything. So there's no one way to do any of the active of things. Motivating the students that to get to mo motivate them to get, get to the process of learning and get interested in learning. Right. Uh, which would come first? Would make them ask questions would come first? Uh, or, uh, I, I generally, based on what I know of the motivation literature, and there's two learning styles that I actually do like and agree with. There's sequential versus global, or there's big picture versus detail. And some people build their learning brick by brick by taking the details and putting them together until they create a structure. And they don't see the big picture until they have all the bricks in place. Other people are the opposite. They require the big picture before they can see where the bricks fit. And they cannot understand why they're learning what they're learning until they see the big picture. So I tend to default, and I will show the big picture first, then I'll provide the detail, then I'll show the big picture again. Because it won't damage the people that build their meaning by bricks to see the big picture, they just will ignore it. It won't have meaning for them yet. But it will make it so that the students who need that actually can learn. And then when I come back around and reinforce with the big picture at the end, I've made a bookend out of it. And the students that need to see the big picture at the end now have it. And, and the students that need it at the beginning aren't harmed by that. So I tend to, whenever there's an issue like that, to try to default to both and. Um, it's reinforcing it. It's repetition. Uh, and, and so it's. Yes, it takes a little bit of time. Yes, it means deliberately saying, OK, how do I do this? But like I said, I would rather cover a little bit less content and increase the percentage that they actually learn. Uh, in the end, that's a much better use of time. Thank you. So, thank you. Yeah. And faculty, at the end of the day, they all undergo the same standardized testing. Yep. And that standardized right. testing is very limiting. So you get to draw. Right. Right. And often the standardized testing does not allow you to see it. Right. Right. It excuses you. Right. Yeah, I I um I tend to level with the students, so to me this is a part of partnering with them. To say, look, we live in a world in a system where you're gonna have to take a standardized test. I'm not going to pretend that this is magic or that this is actual learning or that this is that this is the world we live in. There are plenty of things I have to do that require filling out forms that mean nothing. And I have to do it. And so I say, OK, I have to do it. I have to file my paperwork for taxes. So I try to turn it into a recognition. There's nothing magic about school, about university. It is who we are, how we are, what we're going to be doing later. So, so we just happen to be in a more structured environment while we're in university. So that's how I approach the issue of standardized tests. I say, look, we've got to take a standardized test, so let's make sure you're going to take it. You know it's important, whether you, whether you agree with it or not, it is important. So let's make sure that we're working on what you need in order to take the standardized test. And 
let's also look at the bigger picture of why we're here in the first place. So let's make this fun if we can. <laughs> let's make this engaging. Let's let you find the things that you're actually interested in to work on. And when I've done that, I've had students actually go out of their way to do work that wasn't assigned. They go out of their way to do extra things that they're not going to get marks for. Um, because we're trying to, c I'm creating an environment where it's like, this is about learning and learning is fun. And yeah, we're also going to prepare you to take the standardized test that you have to take. But it, it, can, it can work really well. And we're doing this right now with English language um, at Curtin, where English language is it's a requirement to pass a test. And yet we're also embedding it in the bigger picture of communication and the effectiveness in communication. And that's a bigger thing that's necessary, not just to take a test. So. You'd be surprised, though, because when someone is truly engaged, it's like our capacity expands. It's like the, the joke, if you really like sweets and you eat all your dinner, but you always have space for sweets. <laughs> so it's a little bit like that with the students that, yeah, it doesn't, we make up that we don't have enough time. But I really think that if there's a way to actually, to engage students, to, to get at what interests them, there's a lot more capacity for learning than we, than we give them credit for. Like I said, for us, it's the same way. When I'm really engaged in something, you can't stop me from learning. I will go out of my way to find out information, to look up videos, to, to look up things to read. Um, you know, give me the permission to do that, and I'm there. And a lot of times, that's all our students need. Uh, they, 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 yes, they're constrained. They've got tests, they've got classes, they've got time constraints. So do all of us. But I think that there's more that they can do if we, if we invite them to do so. I think that's probably enough. You've all been very patient, and I appreciate your uh, coming today. And I don't think I have to rush off anywhere quite yet. So I'm happy to stay and chat more if, if people want to, but I want to make sure you have permission to leave. So thank you very much.